So I'll go ahead and do an introduction here. So Steve is going to be presenting today. And Steve and his wife, Kathy, got their start in beekeeping 25 years ago from a retired farmer who felt that Steve needed his own bees to help in pollination of his backyard orchard. Since then, his apiary has grown at times to over 30 colonies located on his beholding acres. Steve has been an avid student of the honeybee and has produced several educational seminars through the Tri-State Beekeepers Association in Wheeling, West Virginia. He has served as president of the club for the past 10 years and has been treasurer for the West Virginia Beekeepers Association for the last four years. In 2017, Steve attained the rank of master beekeeper in West Virginia and also through the program at the University of Montana. Steve and his wife, Kathy, were named the 2018 Beekeepers of the Year by the West Virginia Beekeepers Association. Steve remains committed to fostering in the community an appreciation for the honeybee and mentoring novice beekeepers through their involvement in the club. So we're going to get Steve started here and then we're going to stick to the same procedure as Dr. Ramsey did where you guys can just go ahead and put any questions as you have them in the chat feature. Still a couple of people coming in, so. So everybody, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat feature and then Steve is going to address these questions at the end of his presentation. So I'm definitely excited to be able to introduce Steve today. I was glad that I got to see his presentation. So it was one of the ones that I wanted to see. So it worked out well for me. So thank you everyone for coming today. And Steve, without any further ado, it's all yours. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank the West Virginia Beekeepers for asking me to present this program. And I'd like to thank those of you that have joined it um, to have the patience to bear with me and, and endure. Um, I hope I can keep it entertaining, although unfortunately not nearly as entertaining as Dr. Ramsey this morning. Um, but uh, I'd like to um, continue with that. So what I'm gonna do is take me off the screen and I am going to bring up my screen and see if we can't make this a smooth transition without difficulty. So you should be looking at my screen now. And let me begin. We're gonna to speak today about the honeybee as a pollinator. Um, if we're gonna do that, let's start out by saying, what is pollination? Pollination is the fertilization of plants through the transfer of pollen. Of what significance is that, or what does that mean uh, in nature? Well, 120 million years ago, there were no flowering plants as we know them today. There were mosses, ferns, fungi, but there were no flowering plants. And the problem with mosses and, and ferns, um, they have no way to really extend their, their, their reach um, um, in case of, um, in, in, if they're in a hostile environment, for example, flooding, um, drought, overgrazing by animals, about the only way they can extend themselves is, is through runners in their roots or if the branches bend over um, and, and take root, but they have no way to be uh, significantly mobile to move to, to more uh, um, uh, appropriate, more fertile uh, sites. Fungi generate spor sperms and the sperm, sperm, sperms um, blown in the wind will um, uh, allow them to propagate in other areas, but for the most part, they can't move, they can't uh, uh, easily be, uh, uh, find other sites. And so they develop flowering plants. And what the flowering plant is, the flower has the anther, and the anther is the male portion of the, the, the uh, flower. It produces the pollen, which in turn has to be transferred to the female part, the stigma. Once it reaches the stigma, it transfers down through a pollen tubule until it comes into the ovule uh, and, and, and combines with the ovule, the seed, to produce a seed. Um, then it produces, a, and it becomes encapsulated in some sort of a um, 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 container, whether it be a nut, a fruit, a vegetable. Um, but the, the, the seed then is encapsulated in that uh, container to move to another site. But the main problem, or the main uh, um, element is the pollen that's developed. And that's where our honeybee enters in, uh, coated with the, the, the pollen all over her hair. Well, let's talk about the flowers uh, um, evolving from the ferns and the, and the uh, mosses to what we have today. 
the flowers developed a lot of things that would attract a vector, attract a, a, an insect to move the pollen from the anther to the stigma. The flowers develop color. And if you look at the flowers in front of you on the screen, the flowers on the left side, the yellow, are the way we see them. The flowers on the right side are seen in an ultraviolet range. Now, the honeybee sees ultraviolet, and I understand the honeybee doesn't see red, but the honeybee does see a different pattern in that flower that, that actually looks like the bullseye of a target that draws her into the center of the flower uh, where the anther and the, and the stigma are contained, where the pollen exists. So the color is, 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 is an effort on the part of the flower to draw that, that uh, insect into that area. The, they develop fragrance. Now fragrance means nothing to the flower and fragrance wasn't meant to, to um, uh, be pleasurable to us. F f uh, the the um, uh, fragrance is meant to, to draw the honeybee in. The honeybee recognizes that fragrance and is drawn to that flower following that fragrance. So uh, the fragrance is another attempt to attract a vector, the honeybee. They develop the nectar. Nectar does nothing, absolutely nothing for the flower. It simply provides a sweet reward to the honeybee if the honeybee comes into forage take it, 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 and as a reward is given to the nectar. In nature, organisms follow the path of least resistance. The same is of the flower, the same is of my grandson. If I'm able to get the grandson off of the couch to go to the barn to get a shovel, he's not gonna go around the orchard, cut through the stream, uh, go down to the garden before he goes to the, the, the barn. And then he's not gonna bring the shovel up the driveway to the mailbox before he brings it back to the house. If I can get him to go for the shovel, hopefully he'll go directly to, from the house to the barn, get the shovel and bring it back to the house. They follow the path of least resistance requiring the least energy expenditure. Production of the nectar is a high energy expenditure for the flower to the point that <clears throat> as soon as Excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me. As soon as fertilization occurs, as soon as that pollen reaches that ovule, nectar production stops. The flower does not make the nectar for its benefit. The flower makes that nectar solely to draw that, that uh, honeybee in to, to uh, forage in the flower. An ex experiment was done with the primrose. This is a five lobe primrose, five petals on this primrose. They took a primrose and they played five different sounds, well, four different sounds in front of it. Through a computer, first they had silence, and then they generated three tones, a low tone, medium tone, higher pitch tone. And then finally, they, they played the sound of a honeybee hovering four inches away from that flower. Computer generated, no honeybee, just the sound. When they did that, Within three minutes of the time they introduced the honeybee sound, now not the other sounds, there was no response to the other sounds, but to the honeybee sounds, within three minutes, that flower increased the, nec the, the uh, sugar content of that nectar between 12 and 20%. That flower engineered that nectar to be a greater re reward for that honeybee in response to the sound of that honeybee hovering in front of it. They thought, no, nah, this is wrong, this, this, nah, this was a fluke. So they took a jar and they put the jar over top of the primrose flower, did the same thing, played the, the, the uh, uh, different uh, um, uh, frequency tones, played the sound of the honeybee, no response. So they took the jar off and they took one of the petals off of that primrose. So the primrose now had four petals remaining. Same experiment, same town, no response. When that primrose flower is intact and you play the sound of a honeybee hovering in front of it, that primrose increases the sugar content of the nectar within three minutes and it increases it by 12 to 20 percent, showing the marriage or the, the, the effort the honey the flower has come through to uh, become attractive to draw that vector, the vector mean uh, an insect that would move the pollen from the, the stigma to the anther, from the anther to the stigma. What great length that flower has gone through in evolving to those functions. So now let's look at our honeybee. 60 million years ago, there were no honeybees. There were carnivorous wasps. They ate other insects. They didn't forage, they weren't in pollen, they weren't in nectar. They simply ate other insects. 
but they looked around and they saw all these things on the horizon that maybe in some way we could take advantage of, maybe in some way we could make use of that. And so the WASP began to evolve. evolve. And one of the things the WASP did was develop branch sete. The hairs that developed on the wasp, who was bald, grew into the hairs that we see on the honeybee today. And those, those hairs are barbed or hooked on the end so that they better attract the pollen grain. If you look at the honeybee's hair under an electron microscope, you see it's actually hooked. And these plants, uh, 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 the um, grains of pollen, collect on those hairs so that when the honeybee is moving from flower to flower, she's actually transferring pollen from flower to flower. Those hairs are so effective that when the honeybee returns to her colony, she may have four to 5,000 grains of pollen on those hairs, making her a very, very effective dust mop to gather the, uh, the pollen. So in returning, there's our dust mop, leaving the flower. All right. So now the dust mop has pollen all through her hair and needs a way to clear all of that pollen off of her hair. And so the wasp began to develop an alteration in their hind leg. They grew, the hind leg of the honeybee uh, has a couple of components that allow her to manage that pollen. The first it has on the inside of the leg, the rear leg, are what's called combs. And they're very short, bristly uh, hairs that occur. She can take that leg and brush it through the rest of her body to clear all of the pollen off of the, uh, off of the body, collecting it on the combs. Once it's collected on the combs, she goes to the opposite hind leg. This is the outside of, of her other back leg. And she rakes that uh, comb through what's called a rake. She drags it through that rake. And in doing so, she collects it in a, in a small uh, uh, bolus of, of pollen. She then takes uh, her uh, front leg, moistens it, it, collects a little bit of nectar, moistens that bolus, and then she's able to make it collect on the, on the, the pollen basket of the, uh, uh, the leg. Uh, pollen basket is just a smooth membrane with bristled hairs on the sides of it that allow that pollen, that bolus of pollen to be collected so that when she returns to the um, uh, colony, she has that pollen with her. If we look at the, at, at, at the actual leg, this is the outside of a, a honeybee's leg. So you see the rake through which she draws that, the, the other leg to collect the pollen. You see the pollen basket where she's able to uh, accumulate and carry it so that when she leaves that flower, she has a large collection of pollen that she's uh, uh, acquired by raking it off of her body. Uh, and that pollen is contained in that basket to return. That honeybee can actually carry half of her body weight uh, between the two legs full of pollen like that. And if you watch them closely, uh, maybe you sit outside of your hive and watch them on the landing board coming in, they carry tremendous amounts of pollen and you wonder how they can fly with such big balls of pollen. All right, so now we have the pollen that she's collected and they further developed then to make use of this nectar that she was bringing in. The honeybee developed what's called the, the crop or the honey stomach. So that when she forages, she takes nectar in, is transferred down and stored in this, this crop. So it allows her to, to bring it back to the colony at the front of the hive. She then brings back that nectar uh, to another uh, bee, bee awaiting to be taken in to process into honey. Now people will say to you, well, that honey is nothing but bee vomit, but there's a sphincter at the end of that crop that holds that nectar from transferring down into the intestine. In the same way, when she expresses that nectar, none of the content of that intestine moves through. Now she can willf willfully relax that sphincter to allow her to consume some of the nectar for nutrition. But for the most part, when she's carrying nectar in there to be used as honey, it's sealed off and does not transfer into the digestive tract. But that crop allows her to bring back a tremendous amount of honey when she re or nectar when she returns to the colony. Um, then that nectar, as you know, is processed and developed into honey where it's stored and, and used as their carbohydrate. So the honeybee developed the, 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 the sweet nectar reward that the flannet flower provided, developed that into honey and makes use of that honey to provide energy to allow them to heat the colony all winter long the honey becomes their carbohydrate. 
In the same way, in an attempt to make use of the pollen, the honeybee developed a couple of uh, glands in the head, the hypopharyngeal and the mandibular gland. Those glands allow that honeybee to take that honey, consume that honey, process that honey, and then turn it back out in the form of jelly, whether it be royal jelly or worker jelly, that's fed to the, the young in the larval stage as a nutrient. Just as an as aside, you as a mammal and the bee are the only two entities on earth that can take an outside food, process that food, bring that food back out in another state to be fed to the young. And the mammal is called milk and the honeybee is called the jelly. You as a mammal and the bees are the only two entities on earth that perform that. So the honeybee has learned, make, learned to make use of the pollen to bring it back and feed to the larva in the, uh, in the form of jelly. It becomes their protein source. So the honeybee or the wasp evolved in a lot of different ways to allow them to manage the nectar and the pollen, to process the nectar and the pollen, and to develop them into food, food stores, food sources. So that shows us how the honeybee and the flower are married together, married together, how they've evolved together. Now let's look at this pollination with, in, in view of the honeybee. Pollination occurs in a variety of different locations. Involves in the in home environment, the home orchard, gardens, out in the wild for the wildlife habitat. Pollination occurs throughout all different flowers in all different areas. Pollination actually is, is, is beneficial. The better the pollination, the more benefit to the fruits and vegetables. It does increase, increase the nutritive and the aromatic uh, components of the fruit, increases the size and the number of the fruit, increases the, the uh, nectar production, and it also increases uh, resistance, enhances resistance to disease. Now this happens all the time, and I never really paid any attention to it. You and I have seen the effects of, 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 of good pollination and of in, ineffective pollination in a variety of locations. In that ear of corn that's poorly formed, the kernels are not in line, they're sporadic, in the cucumber or the berries or the melons that are poorly formed. This is the result of poor pollination. When you don't see effective pollination, you don't see effective development of seeds, and you don't see good, good formation of the, the, the uh, product, the fruit or the vegetable. So it's greatly to the advantage of, of, of orchards uh, or, or, or gardens or um, commercial operations to have efficient and complete pollination so that their product is, 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 is as um, appealing as possible. Commercial pollinators are used for a variety of different sources. Almonds, apples, advocates, uh, blueberries, uh, can um, uh, cantaloupes, cherries, cranberries, cucumbers, uh, sunflowers, watermelon. Pollen industry is very lucrative. Um, in in uh, some instances, such as the almonds, let's talk about the almonds. 1.3 million acres of almond groves exist in California. In those 1.2 million acres, 130 million uh, trees have to be pollinated. To pollinate those trees, they last year in 20, well, this is 2018 numbers, they brought in 2.4 million hives of honeybees for that pollination. 2.4 million hives, not bees, hives. If you take all of the managed hives in the United States, 73% of the managed honeybee hives in the United States are moved into California for the almond bloom. The almond blooms occurs in, in the mid-February, around uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, is when that bloom is in process. At that point, 73% of all of the hives in the United States are moved into California. Now that says a couple of things. That number one demonstrates the profound need of, 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 of hives for that massive pollination. It also demonstrates in that that 73% of the colonies in the country, how large commercial pollination is. When you compare the, the, the number of hives that the commercial pollinators have 
compared to the number of hives that backyard beekeepers, the hobbyists, people like you and me, for the most part, have. Tremendous, large, tremendously significant number of honeybees are in the hands of commercial pollinators. It's very lucrative. Last year, they paid $200 per hive brought in for the almond bloom. After the almond bloom, some of them move in, in north into Oregon and Washington state for the apples. Some come down along the west coast across the southern tier states and back up the eastern seaboard. Uh, they go through uh, uh, the eastern coast until they wind up in, in Maine uh, for uh, cranberries and blueberries. Um, in in uh, 2018, 30 to 80,000 hives were drawn to Maine for the blueberries. And those hives were paid between $85 and $135 per hive. Pollinators were paid $80 per hive for pumpkins, $60 per hive for watermelons, $50 per hive for apples and cranberries. So it's an extremely lucrative uh, operation that draws a, a large, large percentage of honeybees uh, into um, uh, commercial pollination. A recent study showed that the direct value of honeybee population on the, on the, on the uh, agricultural crops was $26 billion uh, annually. The honeybee is a tremendous um, uh, contributor to that. A study was done that taking 100 of the top, uh, the top 100 plants that feed 90% of the world population. Now that's the world, so we're talking about a lot of plants that we're not familiar with, but uh, uh, 100, uh, top 100 plants, 90% of those plants uh, were feeding the world. The honeybees were uh, 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 able to pollinate 73 of those 100 plants. The honeybee is, 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 is quite involved in, in, in feeding the world. A study was done by the US Department of Agriculture and they, they claim one third of the human diet derived from insect pollinated plants. Now. You may read some sources one fourth, one third, one half, but let's just say one third of the population or one third of your diet comes from pollinated plants, whether it be fruits and vegetables, whether it be the, the hamburger that was, was the consumed by the, the cow consumed the alfalfa, in some way they were affected. The honeybee is responsible for pollination of 80% of those plants in your diet. Honeybees are used frequently or universally as the commercial pollinator for a lot of different reasons. They build up rapidly. If you, if you heard um, uh, Dr. Ramsey's talks this morning when he talked about the life cycle of the hornets, you notice that the hornets really, when it, when it emerges in the spring, the, the only uh, um, bee remaining in that colony is the queen. The queen then has to build a nest began to develop young when she has enough workers to take over her uh, jobs, she's able to increase the amount of um, bees, uh, eggs that she lays until it's, it's, it, it develops into a colony that's really large and, and viable. But that doesn't really occur until July, August, September. And that's why you don't really see yellow jackets until this time of year, for they go through a process beginning from only the sole queen in the early spring all the way through production of a full colony by this time of year. They build up slowly. Conversely, the honeybee goes into the winter with a full complement in that colony. Granted, it dies down some through the winter, and in mid-February, she starts to again lay eggs to build up the colony, so that by early spring, when the flowers are in bloom, she has a complement of 30 or 40 or 50,000 bees in that, in that hive that are ready to go out and, and act as pollinators. Hives are easily transported. If you have hives and have transported, you, are, you know all you have to do is sneak up on it at night, seal it up, put a strap around it, and you're ready to go. Can you imagine trying to transport a, a colony of yellow jackets? It wouldn't want to be this boy. But honeybees can be easily transported, and, and, and in that, you see the volume of, honey, of uh, hives that are transported into California for the almond bloom. The honeybee, as we said, has a relatively large surface for pollen attraction. I mean, they're, they're nothing but a dust mop when they fly through the air full of pollen. So in those regards, they're very, very beneficial as a pollinator. And keep in mind, in addition, 
pollination uh, involving the honeybee is not simply in her moving from flower to flower. When she returns back to her hive and moves in between with all of her sisters who full, are full of pollen, there's a transfer of pollen there from bee to bee. So that when she returns back to the uh, uh, hive, she has a, a, a much fuller complement of, of um, uh, pollen to, uh, uh, to disperse. On the other hand, the honeybee is maybe not the best pollinator. As you all know, they're vulnerable to all kinds of diseases, pathology, viruses, all of the troubles that, 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 that we constantly have to uh, uh, be confronted with. They're fairly slow flyers. A honeybee flies maximum about 15 miles an hour. Uh, as a, a dragonfly can fly up to 35 miles per hour. So a honeybee is a slow flyer. They tend to drift from flower to flower. They're not really faithful to where she is. And so if you have an apple orchard and you've hired uh, uh, or contracted to have hives brought in for pollination, there's nothing that says they're not gonna be on the maple tree across the, the fence in the other field. Um, they're not necessarily true to the crop where, where they're introduced. And they're too aggressive to be used in the greenhouses. Um, uh, can you imagine honeybees uh, where you're trying to work on flowers? And the other problem is in the greenhouse, generally, they just go to the, the, um, the uh, light. They go to the uh, glass. So they don't necessarily stay with the flowers. Bumblebees, conversely, are wonderful pollinators in a greenhouse. They're more gentle, they're more docile, and, and they tend to stay true to the flowers. If we look at pollination in the wild, 3,500 species of native uh, honeybees exist in North America. Just as an aside, as you know, the honeybee is not native to North America. The honeybee was introduced to North America in the 1600s in the Jamestown uh, uh, colonies uh, when they brought honeybees over to pollinate their tobacco fields. So a honeybee is not native to the United to North America, but there are 3,500 native species to North America. They tend to be more rapid flyers than the honeybee. They don't drift as much. Uh, males pollinate, as you know, our drones do not, do not uh, forage, uh, but the males of the other uh, native honeybees, uh, native bees do pollinate, and they're far more gentle. Just as an example, let's look at the bumblebee. The bumblebee will forage for up to three hours at a time, moving fairly short distances from one flower to the other. Um, they flower for longer periods of time in the day and they flower in cooler temperatures. The honeybee, on the other hand, um, works for a shorter length of time in temperatures only of above about 50 degrees. They don't forage in the, in the cold and they average only about five, five minutes per foraging flight. And in foraging, they tend to move branch to branch, not flower to flower, but branch to branch. And so as an individual pollinator, the honeybee may not be the best. But on the other hand, from a commercial standpoint of view, because they build up rapidly and because they're easily transported, honeybees are more often used as commercial pollinators. Uh, the uh, Beltsville, um, uh, Maryland Research Lab did a study and over a season, they trapped 1700 uh, bees in all different uh, settings. Of those 1700, only 34 were honeybees. So in the wild, in, 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 in uh, the woods and in, in, in the fields, honeybee is not the primary pollinator by any means. Um, they're they're, they're uh, uh, easily replaced by a lot of na native bees. And there are a lot of native bees out there. There are digger bees, sweat bees, alkali bees, squash bees, leaf cutter bees, mason bees, bumblebees, carpenter bees all different types of bees out there pollinating. Now, let me just drift aside again, as I'm well known to do. Probably you're not gonna remember a lot of what I've said today, but I'm gonna tell you something here that I bet you do remember, and you'll probably forget the rest of my talk, but you'll remember this. You know the difference between a bumblebee and a carpenter bee? You see them both flying around all the time and they look almost identical. And you just wonder what's the difference between the carpenter bee and the bumblebee? The carpenter bee's abdomen is bald. The bumblebee's abdomen is furry. So when you see a bald bee, now you're gonna know it's a carpenter bee. And now you're gonna remember that and forget everything else that old Steve had to say, but you'll remember the difference between a bumblebee 
and a, and a carpenter bee. This is a, a, a fact, or this is a, a, an idea that Dr. Jamie Ellis presented to us um, at one of the talks that he gave us when we had him as a guest. And I find this really, really interesting. This is looking at pollination, commercial pollination, and, and honeybee and, and honeybee population relative to the commercial population, commercial pollination. If you look at the honeybee hives, managed honeybee hives, obviously we are losing bees. I don't dispute that at all. But if you have managed hives and you lose a colony, chances are you may replace that colony. For example, if, if I have six hives in the backyard and I lose two colonies through the winter, I'm probably or maybe going to try to replace at least one or, if, or maybe both. So I've had a loss, but the net loss may not be as great. So let's look at this, this decline in honeybees in terms of net loss. Not total bees lost, not feral bees, just managed bees with a net loss of managed bees. Honeybee hives peaked in 1946 at 5.8 million managed hives. 1946 peak, why? Well, 1946 was World War II. And in World War II, the federal government badly needed the wax as a sealant and as a lubricant for the war effort. To the point where if you were a significant beekeeper and you were in wax production for the government, you got a draft deferment. You had a deferment because you were a beekeeper. In addition to that, during the war, commodities were in shortage. Sugar was, was very scarce. It was rationed. But beekeepers need sugar to feed the bees. You know, as you know, we sugar water by the gallons. If you eight million lives. Now we look at nineteen forty six to nineteen eighty four, there was a net loss of hives nine-tenths of a percent per year. Now remember, we're talking net loss. We're not talking total loss, the net loss. Between 1946 and 1984, net loss of nine-tenths of a hive per year. 1984, what was 1984? 1984 was roughly the onset of the tracheal and then verona mite infestation in North America, 1984. All right, let's look at 1985 to 2006. 1985 to 2006, net loss of seven tenths of a percent per year. Well, wait a minute. You said things are worse. We've got the mites, we've got all kinds of problems associated with the mites, and you're telling me that the loss was actually less. The mites made us better beekeepers. When your grandpa had bees, he had a couple hives out behind the barn, and he only went out behind that barn a couple times a year to get into those bees to take honey. He didn't manage them. He didn't have to manage them. There was nothing to manage other than maybe foul brood or something like that. But for the most part today, you have to be in your hive and you have to be very vigilant to make sure that you've controlled the mites. And as a result, the net loss, net loss has been only seven tenths of 1%. All right, let's look at 2006 to 2016. All right, we have all kinds of things threatening the hives, they're threatening the colonies. We have diseases, we have parasites, we have chemicals, we have loss of, of habitat. We have all kinds of, but you're telling me it increased 1.3% per year? Now, how, how, what's, what's increased 1.3% per year? 2006, a, a, a commercial pollinator was paid 50 cents or $50 per hive to pollinate the almonds, $50 per hive in 2006. In 2016, for that same hive, he was paid $200. The dollar, the economy, the demand has driven up the number of honeybees colonies, managed colonies in the United States. As I say, I, have, I, I, I completely agree. 
Honeybees are in decline in the wild, no question. But in managed hives, they have increased because of the ec economics, because of the demand and, and uh, placed on the need for uh, honeybees hives to um, pollinate the almonds. Now that says a couple things again. That shows the number of commercial beekeepers relative to the number or the, the number of hives commercially managed compared to the number of hives that you and I manage as a hobby. Commercial pollinators, uh, commercial beekeepers have a tremendous, tremendous uh, um, increase or uh, they possess most of the managed hives in the country. If it wasn't for the commercial beekeepers, the pollinators, the honeybees in, in the United States would be severely challenged. It's the commercial beekeepers who are keeping the number of honeybees up. So, you know, there's a lot to be said to and against the commercial beekeepers, but those beekeepers are stewards of their hives because they have to have productive hives. And, and, and as you see, the dollar is what has driven it up. Okay, but let's move on from that. Everybody says, if there are no honeybees, we're gonna die. You know, you've, it's been attributed to Albert Einstein that uh, if we lose the honeybees in three years, we lose the population. Well, he didn't say it, and it isn't really quite that way. Um, rice, corn, wheat, barley don't require pollinators. Even soybeans, 5%, citrus, 16%, peanuts, 2%. So you wouldn't die, but your diet would be changed. And let's just look at this for a moment. If you remember, I said the bulk of the per commercial ball, uh, beekeepers pollinators are pollinating fruits and vegetables that we look at as, as, as luxury foods. Apples, peaches, pumpkin pie, those are things that are kind of luxury. They're around the perimeter of the country, the west coast, the southern tier up the eastern seaboard, they're around the periphery. What's in the center? What's in the center? The breadbasket of the United States rice, corn, wheat, barley, that don't require pollination. Now alfalfa requires honeybee for pollination, but these eight other staple uh, um, 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 uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, these other staple grains don't require pollination. And so there is not a large pollination uh, business being carried, off in, uh, carried out in the central part of the states. The bulk of it is around the periphery of the country. All right, we've agreed there are tremendous threats to the honeybees. Irresponsible use of pesticides, decreased forage area, monocultures, parasites, and viruses. Now, the monoculture, you know, I, I had trouble wrapping around that. What, what does that mean? Well, that means my grandson, again, who wants to live on a, vir a, a diet of Twinkies, ain't going to be a healthy boy. He needs vitamin, vitamins and minerals um, to be healthy. In the same way, the honeybee needs a varied diet for her to be healthy. Um, if she's in the central part of the country where you see huge fields of corn, nothing but corn, you can't even see, it's like an ocean, you can't see to the other side of the field. All they have is, is, is the corn and that is not a sufficient diet for the honeybee. So monoculture is not helping the honeybee health. What you can do as, 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 as a landowner or as a gardener to help to for, uh, preserve the well being of the honeybee is to use wettable pesticides for one thing. Once wettable pesticide dries on the plant, it's, it's not easily uh, convert, uh, picked up by the honeybee. If you use a powder or a dust, just like she picks up pollen, she's going to pick up that dust, return to the, her, her nest mates, and, and um, um, she, they're going to be um, uh, damaged by the, the insecticides. Spray at night when they're not foraging. Minimize the use of fungicides. Fungicides seem to be one of the, the, the most toxic uh, uh, elements for the honeybees. And follow label directions. If it calls for a 2% concentration, 6% is not better. Follow the directions. Now, when I speak to gardeners and that, they say, well, what can we plant for the honeybee? What can we plant for, for, to help the honeybee? Well, when I look at my honeybees, my honeybees are deriving their most significant um, 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 uh, nutrition from the trees. 
here in the northern panhandle at Wheeling, we have we start with maple, then redbud, red, uh, black locust, tulip, poplar, linden trees, and then in the fall this time of year, knotweed, aster, goldenrod, sumac, and wild mustard. Now, in the southern, central, and southern part of the state, you have probably different flower or different uh, trees that dominate. But up here, this these are our primary trees. If my wife in the backyard has a collection of flowers and she has a bed with maybe 100 blooms on it at that time, and adjoining that is a maple tree that's got 10,000 blooms on it, well, chances are my bees are going to be in my maple trees a little bit more than what is in her beautiful gardens. But in terms of gardeners, I suggest plant what you like, plant what is most appealing to you. But you want to include a variety of different flowers, shapes, colors, sizes, and blooms, and in massive bleed, um, plantings to, to draw the honeybee in. Two or three flowers might be attractive, but two or 300 flowers in a bed would be much more attractive to them. And to be a bee observer, just watch to see what the honeybees are, are foraging on. And, and in doing so, that's what you want to plant. And so in conclusion, let me say that if you have a peach blossom and a pollinator, you're going to have a peach. But if you have a peach blossom with not a pollinator, you're going to have a peach blossom. And that's just about what it amounts to. So with that, um, I want to thank you for your patience in listening to me. Um, sometimes I kind of get carried away and, 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 and get sort of boring, but um, I appreciate your, 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 um, your participation. And uh, with that in mind, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, field those questions for you. Michelle asked, so heated discussion in our household. Is Roundup dangerous to honeybees or not? You asked me a hard question. Roundup is hard on honeybees and probably I, I don't have the good, that good answer. I would say if you use Roundup, what I say is you want to spray it at, at, at night or in the evening when they're not foraging. When you spray when you want to spray when there's no wind and certainly you don't want to spray any flowers that they are foraging in. But to say definitively, is it that harmful or not? I apologize. I, I can't give you a good answer on that. Um, so. We just said we have a small orchard, peach, apple, pear, cherry, when they bloom. I see all kinds of pollinators and very few honeybees. That was just an add-on to hers. I just didn't see the whole thing at first. Say it again? It was just an add-on to the end of her question. And what if anybody she... has any other questions, they could just type them in the chat box. Okay. Oh, she's asking why. So why? So we have a small orchard, peach, apple, pear, cherry. When they bloom, I see all kinds of pollinators, but very few honeybees on them. So she's asking why she's not seeing them on her. Well, picture. that's what I said. That, 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 that the, commercial, the, the honeybees are used greatly in commercial operations because they can be transported and, 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 and um, uh, put in, in large concentrations in an orchard. But as I say, there are 3,500 other pollinators. <clears throat> and so a lot of your pollination is carried out by sweat bees, alkaline bees, squash bees, a lot of other um, uh, uh, bees that are involved in pollination. Nothing says it has to be honeybees. Um, and and it, it, incidentally, um, if there is something else in the area that's in bloom that's more attractive to them, has a greater pollen content, uh, a greater nectar content, they will be at them. For example, uh, pears are very poorly pollinated by um, honeybees because they have a poor nectar content. So the honeybees really don't get into to pears. Um, another thing that may be um, different flowers produce nectar at different times of day. And it may be that when your peaches are, are in bloom and the nectar is being produced, there may be a, a, a flower somewhere else in the neighborhood that has a greater nectar content at that time. Um, squashes, I think, and, and pumpkins, um, they have a, a nectar production, I think is in the morning, the nectar production shuts off in the afternoon. So there are a lot of different reasons why, but um, the bottom line is in the wild, honeybees are not the primary pollinator. There are, there are a bunch of other bees out there pollinating. All right, any other questions? That's all that we have up there. Okay, well then with that, um, I certainly appreciate your patience and, and your attention, and um, um, I invite you to, to uh, tune in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evenings. There are a lot of other nice uh, to topic, uh, uh, 
topics uh, chosen and a lot of good um, uh, speakers presenting. And so I would really encourage you to take advantage of this, this uh, free offering from the West Virginia Beekeepers uh, in attempt to, to continue the, the uh, tradition of fall conference. So with that, thank you.